Well, this morning, I entitled this message for Palm Sunday, The Strongest Man, and I hope that uh, I will demonstrate what I mean by that title, and you'll understand it uh, by the end of this sermon. Here's the last passage of scripture that we're going to have this morning for the sermon. Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 20 and following through to verse 35. Hear the word of God as it's recorded there. Then Jesus entered a house. And again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for it. And I'll invite you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is holy and it is good. And we ask that you would help us to unpack the mysteries in it. We ask that you would edify your people through the preaching of your word. So give me the words to speak and give us the ears to hear. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, doubtlessly, there is a lot that is going on here in this passage. But I think a couple of questions about power or a couple of questions about authority help us to bring order to this text, right? Because there's so much going on. Interactions with family members, interactions with the religious leaders, strange sayings, a story in the midst of it. But we can bring order to all of this through two questions. First... Who has the power to define, or you might say redefine, family? What is family? Who has the power to do that? And then the second question is this. Who has the power to bind, tie up the strong man in the story that Jesus tells? Who has the authority? Who has the power to tie up the strong man so that his house might be plundered. So let's look at each of these questions in turn and try to understand these questions about authority, about power, and what they are to teach us from this text. First of all, who has the power to define or redefine family? Now, it was Robert Frost. That was an English teacher. I know this is the case. It was Robert Frost who wrote, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. And and we can chuckle. It's a humorous line, right? All of this have to, the the have to's of it make us laugh. But it's sad also because the reason that we're laughing is because we know how oftentimes this can be totally true. Easter's next weekend. You might be expected to go home and be with family. You might be dreading it. 
guess what? Your family might be dreading it too. Okay? Thanksgiving. Christmas. Many of us feel like we have to go home. And equally, many of our families feel like they have to take us in. Yet why all of this have to? Why this mentality about family being difficult and hard? Well, the cultural expectation is that our families should be close-knit. It should be the closest relationships that we have. That's the expectation that our culture gives us. Just think about some of our common sayings, if you don't believe me, right? Blood is thicker than water. Okay, good. You're, you're going to play along here. Home is where the... All right. There's no place like... All right. Our culture has pounded into us this ideal of family. Family ties should be the closest ties of all. And consequently, these relationships carry a weight that other relationships simply do not carry. And we feel conflicted when we don't have strong family bonds. Uh, we feel bad when we don't really want to go and spend time with our blood relatives. If, however, there is a premium placed in our culture on the family. It was nothing, nothing in comparison to the premium placed upon family in Jesus' day. One Jewish scholar explains ancient family expectations in this way. Just let these words sink in. Think about the weight of family in Jesus' time. Children could expect to grow up in close proximity to grandparents along with other members of the extended family, and they were expected to maintain permanent and harmonious relationships, permanent and harmonious relationships with their brothers and their sisters. The family was the center from which all other aspects of community and peoplehood emanated. What is the central, closest bond of any community? It is the family. And in Jesus' day, there was a great weight placed upon these family bonds. So for those who are with Jesus in today's passage, the expectation when Jesus' brothers and his mother come looking for him, and they call in to the household and they say, tell Jesus we're out here, their expectations as they're sitting around Jesus is that certainly he will go out to them. He won't hesitate to go. Because the claim that that family unit his mother and his brothers have upon him is far greater than the claim that they have upon him. The family is to be that closest relationship, that central place of relationship. <laughs> but Jesus here, he blows up these assumptions at the end of today's text. He claims the authority to define what the true family is. True family, according to Jesus, is about our allegiance and our submission to the very will of God, not merely blood relationships. True family is birthed through faith. True family is proved through one's faithfulness to God's law. In short, Jesus redefines family here, and he's turning his community's expectations on their head when it comes to family. Everything's going upside down now when it comes to family. People would have been quite surprised, shocked, even perhaps appalled at what Jesus says here. And this is not just my thinking on what Jesus means here. This is certainly the lesson we are supposed to learn. There is a closer family relationship than merely blood ties. That's what Jesus is saying. And the reason I say that is he explicitly says it, but it is implied in the structure of this narrative. Just think for a moment with me about what we're seeing here. It teaches us the very same lesson. Jesus with his followers, where are they? They're inside a household. In fact, they're sharing a meal. We know this because Mark tells us 
There were so many people inside this household that they could hardly eat. This is how I feel when we get Natalie's brothers and sisters all together with all of my nieces and nephews and my five kids, and we're trying to eat, right? Elbows colliding with elbows. You better get the food quick because it's going to disappear. You feel like you can hardly eat, like there's no room to spread out and, and, and eat some food. That's what our family meals look like. That's the kind of family meal, I think, that's being demonstrated here. This is a family meal inside this household. Now, think about what's happening with Jesus' mother and his brothers. Where are they at? Not inside the household. Outside the household. They can't get in. They have come to claim Jesus, to claim authority over Jesus. But Jesus will have none of their authority over him. They are the ones on the outside looking in, even though there is a blood relationship here, even though they're part of what the society, the culture, expects will be the closest family bonds. They are not Jesus' true family. Jesus' true family are those who've trusted in God, and who follow God. There's both an explicit and an implicit lesson here in this text about family and about who gets to define family, who has the authority to define family. Our Lord Jesus Christ is creating something brand new. He's come to start a new and ultimate family, the very family of God. And only Jesus has the power to create this household, which Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, tells us is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Paul in Ephesians there is talking about the household of God built upon Christ. Only Christ has the authority to create such a household, to create such a family. And there's nothing like these family relationships inside the household of God. And, and this was really impressed upon me this week. I was talking to one of my very good friends who for all practical purposes has been orphaned from his blood family, condemned by them, their backs turned upon him. Uh, he's been orphaned by them. And, and I was getting mad. Uh, as I was talking to him about this, you know, I'm a, he's my friend and I want to defend him and I'm getting upset about it. And he stopped me and he said, don't be upset. Don't be upset. I have friends. I have family. I have it in my church family. I have it with you. I have a support network. I have brothers and sisters and mothers in the church. What an encouragement to me that he felt that way. What a beautiful blessing is the family of God in a local church where we are all striving to follow after God and to love one another and to be united to one another. As Jesus prays in John 17, that we would love one another and be united with one another, even as he and the Father are one, that we would be one. Now, you have not experienced this oftentimes in the church, but that is the plan for the family of God. And what a blessing. What a blessing. When it materializes. When it happens. When we feel it. Like with my friend. You know the question here in this passage. Before us today. Uh, the question that echoes out. Over 2,000 years of church history is this. Will we be on the inside. Celebrating with Jesus living as his brothers and sisters under his power and authority? Or will we be on the outside looking in because we want to presume authority over Jesus like his mother and his brothers in this passage assume? That's what they're doing. No, we have authority over you, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, no, no. The family of God will be determined by those who follow me by those who allow me to assert my authority over them and in their lives, my loving, blessed, gracious, merciful authority. 
That's how the family of God will be birthed, will be created. And that's the question before you today. Is it going to be your authority over Jesus' authority so that you'll be on the outside looking in, or will it be Christ's authority in your life so that you are knit together with other believers in Jesus Christ to follow him in the blessed family of God? Don't ever stop asking that question. That is a question to to visit over and over again throughout the Christian life because our temptation is always to say, no, my authority, my authority, not yours, Christ. You can have this much, Jesus, but not anymore. But Jesus says, no, in my family, I am the one who has authority. Well, let's move on to the second question about power. The second question about authority. Let's move on to Jesus' confrontation with the religious leaders in this text. And I absolutely love Jesus in this picture. I mean, don't miss out on what he does. He he blows up the expectations when it comes to family, right? And so everybody's like, what? What is he doing? He thinks he gets to define family? And then he says, you know what? With the religious leaders, I'm going to tell a little story. And you know who's going to be the hero of the story? A robber a thief, right? This is not like any other rabbi that these people have ever encountered. He's like, hey, I'm going to tell you about a righteous robber. That's basically his story here. Who has the power to bind the strong man when the strong man's in his house and to plunder him, to rob him? This is a hilarious little scene. And the Pharisees had to be scratching their heads. Like, what is he talking about? A righteous robber. To get to this story and to understand it, you got to remember the accusation that's been leveled against Jesus here by these religious leaders. They're grasping. They're like, we see what you're doing, casting out demons, healing people. We see it, and we've got a theory about what you're doing, Jesus. What you're doing, the power you're using, is from Satan, the prince of demons, Beelzebul. That's how you're getting the power to do all of the things that you do. They're saying you're a secret envoy from Satan, using Satan's power to deceive people, Jesus. That's who you are. You're parading as a prophet from God, but you're not a prophet from God. That's the accusation that they have. And so Jesus, in response, says, let me tell you a story about a righteous robber. He says this, verse 23, how can Satan drive out Satan, if a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. So I'm going to get in a second to this whole idea of plundering the strong man, but let me just address a question that I have to get out of the way first. It's the million-dollar question here, because until I do, none of you are going to pay attention to me about the story. There's a question that every single person who reads this passage immediately wants the answer to. And it's because you all have guilty consciences. Right? What's the eternal sin? And really the question there is, have I committed the eternal sin? You all want to know, don't you? What is this sin that cannot be forgiven? You're, you're, You're wondering that and you're like, I'm not paying attention to this story about a strong man who gets his house plundered until you tell me whether or not I've committed this sin that will not be forgiven. Fair enough. Let's answer the question. Jesus answers the question here. The eternal sin that won't be forgiven is this. It's a specific judgment or misjudgment that Jesus is motivated by evil rather than by good. That the Holy Spirit is working through Jesus for evil, for Satan, for the devil, rather than for God. And you're like, well, I wonder, have I ever ever called something that is obviously from God evil? Have I ever attributed the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan and not 
to God? Well, if you're wondering that question, here's the beautiful truth. The beautiful truth is that your concern demonstrates that you have not committed this sin. Because this sin comes out of a hard heart. A stony heart. The heart that Jesus is warning these religious leaders about in themselves, that you're looking at me and you're trying to condemn what is obviously good. Now, if you're worried about this, it means you haven't committed that sin. It means you have a humble heart. It means you have a heart that is very soft and concerned that you wouldn't commit such a sin, that you wouldn't do this, call what's clearly good evil. Condemn Jesus' work is demonic. No, you don't have the pride and the arrogance uh, to do that if you're concerned about that. And your hearts haven't become hard as these religious leaders seem to be heading in that direction. And Jesus is warning them that this is really a merciful warning from Jesus. He's like, don't go down that path. It is a path that will keep you from the mercy and the grace and the love of God. You won't turn because your hearts will be too hard. So that in my understanding, is this unforgivable sin. And if you're concerned that you have committed it, well, then just know that that concern shows that you have not committed it. So you guys are all like, ah. Now let's move on to the story. The story so often neglected. This little parable about robbing a strong man. What is Jesus doing with this little tale? Why is he telling this little story? Well, to begin, he's answering the accusations of the religious leaders, and he is super rational here, right? Uh, this story is very logical. Basically, Jesus tells a story, and he says, you cannot play for both sides. You can't play for one team and the other team at the same time. You can't score goals for one team and the other team at the same time. Jesus is saying, hey, your logic is all wrong here. You can't do what you're saying I'm doing. You can't attack Satan at the same time be on Satan's side. That's basically what Jesus lays out here. R.T. France, who's a great theological scholar, he sums up the absurdity of what the religious leaders are doing here and the accusation that they make here in this way. Just listen to this. Since strength depends on unity, an attack on any part of Satan's domain is a sign not of collusion with him, but a threat to his power. What is Jesus doing here with this story? Jesus thus ridicules the strange notion that these religious leaders have, that somehow you can play on both teams, that the ruler of demons might allow his power to be used against his own forces. No, France writes, Jesus will have none of it. So Jesus, the first thing he's doing here, and we have to see this, is he's just saying, here's a logical answer to your accusation. I'm not playing on both sides. I can't play on both sides. If I'm doing things that are clearly in favor of the kingdom of God, I can't be playing also for the kingdom of Satan or the kingdom of demons. And this is, I think we need to stop for just a second and recognize how desperate, how incredibly desperate these religious leaders are to defame Jesus. Right? They were, they're just grasping at anything now to make sure that people don't follow Jesus. They are so arrogant. They are so concerned with their, their self-glory that they are going to do whatever they can do. They are going to say whatever they can say to embarrass Jesus and to take away any attention that's positive that he can get. Their hearts are very hard, and there is a warning for us here. We need to be careful that our hearts don't follow their hearts. We have to be careful to maintain soft hearts towards the work of God, towards people who are hurting and in need, whether they're like us or not, whether they're on the same side of the political aisle as we are or not. It doesn't matter. God says you will have a soft heart towards them. You will love them. You will preach the gospel to them. We have to be softened day in and day out our culture wants to breed in us a hard heart. Our culture wants us to hate others on the other side of any issue from us that we can. That is a heart that is after the Pharisee's heart. That is a heart that's after the religious leader's heart. That is not a heart 
that's after Jesus Christ's heart. Amen? We cannot be a people who go down that path. Just That's a warning for us that's right here. Turn away from such thinking. It's not Christ-like. But there is more going on here than simply a logical answer to this accusation from the religious leaders. With this story, Jesus is once again, as he does over and over and over again in his ministry, he's making an unbelievable claim about himself. Jesus is saying something about himself. And it is a claim about authority that these religious teachers should have immediately recognized. And I say that because their whole game, their whole job was to know the scriptures inside and out. And Jesus is alluding to the Old Testament scriptures here. And he's saying, there is something about me that you need to recognize at this moment. In his story, Jesus says, I'm the one who subdues the strong man. Isn't that the point of the story? How can you plunder Satan's house unless you tie him up first? And who's plundering Satan's house here, right? Who's healing people from their diseases? Who's casting out demons? It is Jesus. Am I not the one who is plundering him? Am I not the strong man in this story? But there is a a scripture passage in the prophet Isaiah. Uh, First of all, there's a long section in, in the same passage about the promised Messiah of Israel. And and so Isaiah kind of lays that out for us. Here's some beautiful truth about the Messiah. And then there's this passage that talks about what God is going to do, what only God can do. Let me read it for you. Isaiah 49, verse 24 and 25. This is the illusion that Jesus makes here, the illusion that the religious leaders should have picked up. Isaiah 49, can plunder be taken from warriors? So take out warriors there. Can plunder be taken from strong men, warriors, or captives? Can captives be rescued from the fierce? Again, take out fierce, put in strong men. But this is what the Lord God says. Yes captives will be taken from warriors and plunder retrieved from the fierce. And your children I will save. Who can tie up the strong man? Who can plunder warriors and fierce people? The powerful. Nobody can except for God. God is the only one who is capable of tying up the strong man, i.e. Satan, and plundering his household. And consider what the plunder here is in Isaiah 49. What's up for grabs? Is it silver and gold? No. Is it property? No. Is it it castles? Is it, what is it? It's us. We are what's being plundered from Satan. We are being what's robbed from the devil. It is the children of Israel. It is the children of the faithful community of God, God's family. He is going to rescue them, he says. Only God can do this. That's clear in Isaiah 49. Only God can do this. Jesus is the one who binds the strong man. Jesus is the one who frees the slaves and captives in his story, and only God can do this according to scripture. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, I am no less than God in the flesh, and I have come to bind the strong man. I have come to set the captives free. Only I can do this. And the religious leaders, the religious authorities, they'll catch on. They recognize what he's saying so many times. He's claiming even to be God. Yes, that's the one time they get it right. Yes, he is. Now, what are they going to do with that information? Well, they align themselves against it. They put him to death. They hand him over to the authorities to be crucified. What will you do with it?
Jesus is claiming to be nothing less than God in the flesh, come to plunder the strong man. Jesus is the strongest man. Oh yeah, there's a strong man out there, but there is the strongest man. And he is no other than Christ Jesus the Lord. Isaiah 61, verse 1, this is what the Messiah says of himself. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness to the prisoners. Will you be plundered? Will you allow yourselves to be stolen away from Satan? Will you be set free? Praise God for Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the strongest man. We thank you for his boldness here uh, to tell this story about a righteous robber and say, I indeed am the righteous robber. I am the strongest man. I am the one who is bound Satan in and now I'm stealing away his plunder, his, his treasures, those he's enslaved. We thank you for Jesus and we ask this Palm Sunday that when we look to the cross this week that we would recognize the war that Christ Jesus wages upon sin and death there. And as we celebrate the resurrection that we would celebrate his victory over sin and death. Amen.